Welcome to the primer. So today I'm going to be talking about um, specifically non-coding variants and how we can use them to actually dissect the function underlying genetic traits in order to eventually translate it to uh, mechanism and ultimately th therapeutics. So um, what, what the promise of genomics has always been was that we were going to use the human genome to understand human disease and the function through which genetic differences between us lead to differences in our disease predisposition. The mechanism for doing this is initially very simple. You basically carry out a simple chi-square statistical test across the entire genome to look for genetic variants whose identity correlates with a particular phenotype. And we've heard a lot about this throughout the primers this semester. What you end up with is uh, a Manhattan plot, of which you've probably seen dozens, which tells you for every location in the 23 chromosome pairs here in the human genome, and for every genetic variant in the population, and there are about 6 million of those that we ascertain or infer uh, computationally, what is the genetic association between that variant, whether you have a G or an A at a particular position, and how that correlates with uh, a phenotype? In this particular case, male pattern boldness. And what you see is this very strong genetic hit in one particular location of chromosome X, which was the whole point of, you know, sequence in the human genome in a way, that we are now able to ascertain genetic variation and see how it relates to phenotype. The goal is, of course, to understand disease mechanisms, reveal target genes, identify new therapeutics for targeting these genes, and ultimately enable personalized medicine. But to do that, we actually need much more than these genetic hits. And the challenge is that once you have these hits, getting to the mechanism is actually still quite difficult. <laughs> the first challenge is that the vast majority of these genetic hits are in fact falling in non-coding regions. So if you actually open up the hood in these regions of association and you look for protein altering variants, you don't find any in 80% of cases. And the top genetic hit is not protein coding in 93% of cases. So that basically means that we need to actually understand the non-coding genome in order to understand human disease. The second challenge is that the moment you start looking at these genetic variants, the cell type in which they're acting is simply not known. In 90% of, of cases, we're not going to know that there's a coding variant, and that actually makes it very hard to identify the cell type of action. Because when we have a coding variant, it basically says, well, look at the function of that gene. And tracing the function of that gene, you will be able to eventually trace what cell type is that gene acting in, how can I actually target that particular gene, and so on and so forth. The problem with non-coding variants is that you don't actually have a handle on the gene. And therefore, even finding the cell type of action is actually quite difficult. Finding the causal variant itself is actually quite difficult because, you know, when you have a protein altering variant, you're like, well, that's probably the causal one exactly based on your intuition. But if you don't have a uh, coding variant, you're like, well, it could be any of them. So that's a major challenge. The causal variant is not known and the cell type of action is not known. Moreover, the target gene itself through which the genetic variant is acting is not known because there are many genes in the neighborhood, any of which could be targeted more than a million nucleotides away, as we're going to see in some of the examples that I'm going to show. So what is the remedy for overcoming this limitation? Well, the remedy is to systematically understand the non-coding genome, to basically go and map in a number of different cell types where are the functional elements located so that we now have an annotation and we can actually go back in these non-coding regions of, associ of genetic association and basically try to figure out what is the function of the underlying genetic variants. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So basically, number one, how do we annotate the non-coding genome? And we've been involved in two projects known as the ENCODE project for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements and the Roadmap Epigenomics project that have sought to systematically map these regions and link non-coding regions to the regulators that control them and to their target genes. And we've developed a series of new methods for analyzing these, these data sets in the context of genetics that I'm going to talk about today. So the deliverables that you should ask for when somebody says, here's a non-coding association, are sixfold. Number one, you want to know what is the cell type through which that genetic association is acting. Because if it acts in the liver or if it acts in the brain, you have to two completely different therapeutic avenues. What is the target gene through which it's acting? 
Because again, any of the genes in a neighborhood could be the target. And to develop therapeutics, we are still stuck in modulating genes ultimately. What is the causal variant? And that's important because in a very large region of association, if you don't know what the causal variant is, you actually have a hard time even figuring out what cell type it might be acting in and what you know, regulator might be binding it, which actually is number four of you'd like to know who is actually binding that genetic variant and whose binding is actually disrupted by that association. And then five and six, you want to know at the cellular level, what are the pathways that are affected by this presumed gene dysregulation, and what are the intermediate phenotypes that ultimately lead to disease? Is everybody with me so far in terms of what we'd like to actually know? Great. It may sound hard, hopefully it sound easier by the end of the talk because there are many resources that are now available for doing this. So what I'm going to talk about today first is what are these resources? How do we go about systematically annotating the non-coding genome? annotating the regions of gene regulation, the cell types, the target genes, the nucleotides, and the regulators. And in part two, I'm going to talk about how we can actually apply this to dissect genome-wide association hits, discover new disease regions and new disease genes that are currently invisible using existing approaches, and lastly, understand somatic mutations in the context of cancer. So first, let's talk about characterizing this epigenomic landscape. So I'm going to describe a paper that was published just this February uh, in Nature. This is part of a very large consortium, the Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium, and it follows very much on the footsteps of the ENCODE project. The big difference is that while ENCODE had mapped primarily cell lines, what we're mapping here is going to be primary cells from a large number of different tissues in the human body, as well as embryonic uh, the tissues, and cells differentiated from embryonic stem cells and from iPS cells, as well as a number of primary cells uh, and tissues. And for each of those uh, regions of the human body, what we're going to do is start mapping non-coding uh, information. So we're going to map the epigenomic landscape. So what is the epigenome? The epigenome is the thing that sits on top of the genome. Epi means on top of in Greek, obviously, as you all know. Um, so the three types of epigenetic information are number one, chemical modifications on the DNA itself. This is not changing the nucleotides, but this is changing the interpretation of those nucleotides. So a CPG can actually have a methyl group on the C, giving rise to repression in many re regulatory regions, or sometimes being actually associated with activation in expressed transcribed regions. The second line of evidence is whether a particular region of the DNA is accessible. So that basically means that the regulators are more likely to bind there because the packaging is sort of displaced from the specific nucleotide of interest. And then the third type of evidence is modifications on the packaging of the DNA. These are not touching the DNA itself, but they're touching the histone proteins that DNA is wrapped around. So we have 147 nucleotides that are wrapped twice around every bundle of histone proteins. And each one of these histone proteins has a very long tail that sticks out that can be modified in specific post-translational modifications, specific chemical ways, such as methylation, acetylation, ubiquitination, phosphorylation, and so on and so forth. And there are more than 100 different marks, more than 100 different tags that you can put on these histones. And they work in combinatorial ways sometimes, and other times in additive ways. So that basically means that the particular function of that, let's say, 200 base per chunk of DNA can actually be different, even though the underlying DNA sequence is the same. And why is that important? Because every cell in our body actually carries out a different set of functions. Brain cells and heart cells and lung cells carry out very, very different types of functions, all with the same book of life. And how is that possible? They all have the same copy of the book, more or less, but they're highlighting different regions. And that's, you know, the highlighter and the post-it notes and the underlining are the different chemical modification marks that actually tell every cell what are the important chapters that it should be focusing on to carry out its particular functions. Um, and in this particular case, by reading the cliff notes, if you wish, or the, the margins of the book rather than the book itself, by reading the annotations in the margins, we can figure out two things. Number one, what regions are important in different cell types, which is extremely important because it tells us what makes a liver cell different from a brain cell. And number two, we can actually figure out 
how the genome actually functions because the different functional regions in each one of the cell types have different chemical modifications. So we can actually utilize that information to actually start understanding the code of life itself. Is that clear with everyone? Great. So this is what the data looks like. So when you look at an epigenomic track, this is what it looks like. So I have one of these codes that basically says histone H3, which is one of these bundles here. There are eight histone proteins. H3 has two copies and it sort of sticks out right there. So histone H3 lysine in position number four. So this is, you know, the fourth amino acid going down. It happens to be a lysine, has a single methyl modification. And this one has actually three methyl modifications. And the two are actually different in their underlying function. So we can actually use these codes to basically talk about the specific modifications. You have whole genome bisulfite sequencing that tells you about DNA methylation. You have a bunch of different histone modification marks. You have DNA accessibility that tells you about what regions are actually open. And then you also have RNA sequencing that tells you what regions are actually transcribed and processed into RNA from the DNA. So every one of these tracks basically tells you what is the underlying frequency with which that modification is found in every position of the genome. How do I even get this? By building an antibody against one of these modifications and then using that antibody to pull down all the regions that have that modification from the nucleus. And then I chop up the DNA and I sequence the parts that came down when I, pull, when I do the pull down and then I map the sequence reads that I've obtained back to the genome. And that actually gives me many more reads here and fewer reads here and more reads here and so on and so forth. And that's what gives me the height at every genomic position as I go along for the 3.2 billion nucleotides of the human genome. So you can see the genes here at the top, these tiny little uh, snippets. And you can see that now we have information for the entire genome, not just for the genes anymore. So now we can go back into the genetic regions of association and start saying, well, what combination of histone modification marks was there? Or was that region accessible in specific cell types? Is everybody with me so far? Great. So we have to, however, summarize this information because this is daunting information. And this is just for one of 127 cell types that we have mapped. We can't possibly have you know, thousands of tracks on at the same time in our genome browser in order to interpret this. Do you have a question? Go for it. Yeah, I was wondering, because uh, you see that uh, all these modifications are clustered uh, together and that's empty. So, so the question is, um, all of these modifications are clustered in a small number of regions, like here and here and here and here, and then the rest is empty to quote you literally, which is, you know, you don't find anything here. What does that mean? Well, that simply means that most of our DNA is probably not functional, or at least not active, not biochemically active in this particular cell type. It is still possible that in another cell type, this region lights up and suddenly there's all kinds of activity going on. So before we say something is not functional, we have to make sure that we've assayed the possible relevant cell types. And then if we really don't find anything there, it simply means that with the assays that we have utilized, that region does not show any evidence of activity. That could be interpreted by some people as negative evidence. This is clearly non-functional. Or simply, we don't know that it's functional. And that's the way that we usually interpret it. So about 60% of the genome is simply not active when we look across more than 127 different cell types or at least not at a significant level that we can say, ah, this region is clearly functional. A lot of it has biochemical activity because all of these genes are transcribed and there's a lot of th things happening outside. And there's also marks that are associated with repressed regions. For example, DNA methylation here is higher in the regions that appear to be more boring. And K9 trimethylation, which is a mark of heterochromatin, which is condensed chromatin, is actually higher in these regions that appear to be otherwise active. So we can't interpret you know, simply these marks as, oh, something's happening, because some, some of these marks are telling us that this region is simply repressed. So um, does that answer your question? Great. And then the other uh, intuition that you had was, wait a minute, these are highly correlated with each other. So maybe I don't need to look at a 1,000 different tracks for all of these different cell types. Maybe I can actually summarize this information into a single track. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're basically saying, can I learn the underlying quote unquote function of chromatin at every region of the genome, the underlying function of the epigenome 
at every region of the genome and start annotating different classes of functional elements based on the combinations of marks that I see at that location. And that's exactly what we do. So we basically developed something known as a multivariate hidden Markov model, which we call ChromeHMM, and we let it loose on the genome and we told it, tell us all the different signatures that you find. And it came back with 15, with 15 prominent signatures and it gave them different colors. And then we as humans went back and annotated these colors with names. And we basically called the orange regions enhancers, the red regions promoters, these regions transcribed, these regions repressed, because we could actually tell from other lines of evidence that the same signature was usually associated with the same type of element. Is this clear with everyone? So we basically went through, and now we can summarize with these pretty colors that I'm showing here, this is exactly real data over here, and that tells us that this region is an enhancer, that region is transcribed, this gene here, PAX5, is repressed in IMR90 fibroblasts, which is the cell type that I'm showing you here, and so on and so forth. So there's two colors that you should be focusing on, and maybe even just one. Promoters, which are these proximal regulatory regions that uh, decide where the transcription starts. The transcribed regions are green, and they're coupled with them. The repressed regions are gray. And then these distal regulatory regions are actually going to be the most exciting because these turn out to be the most dynamic across different cell types. How do we know? Because we went and looked, and we basically said, let's look at now this track in 127 different cell types. And that's what this looks like now. So instead of showing you a thousand or several thousand tracks, I'm actually showing you only one per cell type and 127 tracks for the 127 cell types that were profiled. You see the same gene, PAX5 here, that was repressed in IMR90 lung fibroblasts, and it is now also repressed, as you can see, in the vast majority of these cell types, except for a handful of cell types where it appears to be turning on its promoters, turning on its enhancers, and turning on its transcribed region marks. So you can actually see the dynamics of the epigenomic landscape across different cell types and maybe start getting at is a genetic variant that's found here more likely to be acting in T cells or say in brain. And it's clearly more likely to be acting in T cells because that's where that region is active. Okay, so that's the kind of thinking that we're gonna have by basically looking for evidence in specific cell types and then utilizing that evidence to predict what's functional. What's a feature that you notice? You notice that transcribed, that, that transcribed regions are quite dynamic, so this thing turns on and off in different cell types. You see that promoter regions are quite stable. Even when the gene is off, the promoter appears to be on, which is kind of interesting. And you also see that enhancer regions in orange are very, very dynamic, so they turn on and off very you know, rapidly across different cell types. And we're gonna utilize that information to now start wiring up the non-coding genome to start basically figuring out what are the genes that turn on when these enhancers turn on and what are the regulators that appear to be controlling these regions in order to actually get the wiring of the cell. So we're going to use these uh, dynamics to now start taking all of the enhancer regions that you see in orange across not just this region of the genome but the full 3.2 billion nucleotides and we're going to cluster them together based on their coordinated activity patterns. And what we end up with is a small number of distinct activity patterns that basically tell us that all of these regions here are active in the T cells and all of these regions here are active in brain, for example. And what are the genes nearby doing? Well, if you look at T cells, the genes nearby appear to be playing immune functions. And if you look at brain, the genes nearby appear to be playing learning functions, which is kind of cool. It basically says that the uh, that there's coherence in the modules, in the clusters that we're learning, that these genetic regions that are coordinately active are in fact playing very cell type specific roles and that the genes nearby actually very, play, you know, relevant roles for the cell types in which they're expressed. Everybody with me so far? Great. Okay, so the, the other thing that we can do is start now, as I mentioned earlier, linking these regions to whoever is controlling these regions, and how do we know that? By basically looking for sequence patterns, sequence motifs, that are recognized by specialized proteins known as transcription factors that bind the DNA when they see a particular motif. So SRF binds CCA, TA, TA, TGG. So when that motif is appearing over and over again in the same group of enhancers, 
we can say that perhaps this regulator is in fact controlling that particular cell type. And we can also look at the expression patterns of the regulator itself. And if the expression patterns line up, if they are coordinately active with where the enhancer is active, we can actually make a pretty good prediction that that motif is bound by that regulator. And that's what leads to all these regions turning on at the same time. Is everybody with me on this? Great. So then the last thing we can do is actually look at the coordinated activity between the enhancers and their target genes across the different cell types. So in the same way that we cluster these enhancers, we cluster the genes themselves into modules of coordinated activity. And then we utilize the coordinated patterns between the enhancer modules and the gene modules to link individual enhancers to individual target genes. So that actually now allows us to go back into these genetic regions of association and be armed with a lot more information. Instead of simply saying that this genetic region you know, happens to sit within the AFF1 gene, we can actually say, well, what are all of the genetic variants that are active in that region? What are all of the enhancers that they, these genetic variants overlap with? What cell types are these enhancers active in? What target genes are these enhancers predicted to be binding, uh, to, be, to be controlling? And who are the regulators that are predicted to be binding to in turn control these enhancer regions? So we now can go back from this anonymous region of association to very clear predictions about what might actually be going on in this particular region. Who's with me so far? Raise your hands if you guys are with me. Awesome, fabulous, great. Any questions? Okay, so we could just stop here and say, hey, here's all the information, you guys figure it out, bye-bye, we're done. And we, yeah, go ahead. Maybe we will. Yeah. You hit the nail in the head here, which basically said, yeah, so the, the thing, <laughs> Chris is keeping me in check here. So, so um, the question is, uh, are you done? You have 127 cell types, you know, w what's next? And this is very much the beginning. This is nowhere near even the beginning of the end. Um, we need to know how are these regions active in sub-cells, sub-cell types, within the tissues that we have profiled. Heart and liver and brain are extremely non-homogeneous tissues. So we need to actually understand what are the activity patterns within the different cell types of each tissue. What are the activity patterns within different conditions? Stimulated neurons versus unstimulated neurons have different patterns of activity. So we need to actually understand how they respond to different conditions of stimulation. How they respond to different environments. For example, if I'm full or if, my, if I'm empty, my stomach might be doing different things with its epigenome. Number five, across different individuals in this room, we have different genetic variants and we also have different environments. We have different nutrition, exercise levels, and so on and so forth. All of that actually influences how our epigenome behaves, both from the genetic level and from the environmental level. And then lastly, across development, as my body was being formed from a single cell that started dividing and dividing and dividing to basically populate all of the cell types in, my human in the human body, as the cells underwent these developmental stages, the activity of these enhancers was in fact changing. And something that is a problem with my cells now may be due to the way that they developed in what they are now. So we can't simply map adult cells. We actually have to map the developmental trajectory of these cells. So you can see that the problem is daunting. And of course, I'm not satisfied until we're done. But this is a good beginning. Let's now, instead of just putting all that information out there, let's actually start getting some insight as to biological mechanisms underlying human disease. So the first thing that we can do is actually utilize epigenomic maps to predict what are disease-relevant tissues. So that was the first problem that I mentioned earlier of we don't even know what tissue something might be acting in. So how do we gain that uh, understanding? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is that for every trait in the GWAS catalog, we're going to identify all associated regions at some p-value threshold. So I'm basically looking at height, what are all the genetic regions that are associated with height, and I'm showing them in blue, and within them, what are all the genetic variants and their p-value, this is very similar to the Manhattan plot that I showed earlier, that are associated with height. 
Everybody with me so far? So now I can do this for every different trait. And different traits have different genetic regions of association. That's what's really exciting here. So we're gonna now take all of the things in the critical interval and we're gonna evaluate the overlap of each of these regions with tissue-specific enhancer annotations. So now, for example, if I look at in stem cells, what are the enhancers that are active in stem cells? I see that a lot of them are in fact overlapping the genetic variants that are associated with height. So I can put a check mark here, basically saying that height might be you know, that genetic variants associated with height might actually be dysregulating enhancers that are active in stem cells. Is everybody with me so far? If you are, raise your hands. Okay, great. And now I'm simply gonna do that for every cell type. So I'm gonna look at immune enhancers and I'm gonna see that, well, hey, they, they seem to be overlapping uh, the genetic regions that are active in type one diabetes. So maybe I'm gonna put a different check mark here. And I'm gonna do the same thing for heart and I'm gonna see that, oh, there's all these genetic variants associated with blood pressure that tend to be happening in heart and I'm gonna put another check mark there. And then lastly, I'm gonna look at say liver and I'm gonna see that you know, cholesterol associated genetic variants appear to be happening, you know, to be lying in regions of the genome that are active in liver. So I end up with a matrix that basically tells me what traits are likely to be acting in what cell types based on the different genomic regions that these traits are hitting and based on the different uh, activity patterns that every genomic region has in different cell types. Everybody with me so far? Raise your hands. Okay, fabulous, great. So now I'm gonna take this matrix and actually gonna show you real data, okay? This is what the data looks like. So we're now looking at 58 different genetic traits, all of the genetic variants associated with these traits, and what tissues they appear enriched in. And what you see is indeed height appears to be enriched in human embryonic stem cells and no other tissue. Indeed, if you look at type one diabetes, it appears to be acting in T helper cells, but no other cell type. If you look at blood pressure, indeed it appears to be acting in the left ventricle of the heart and no other cell type. If you look at cholesterol, it appears to be acting in liver and no other cell type. It's kind of cool, right? So this is real data. We're just looking at all of the genetic variants associated with each of these traits and the enhancer maps that we have built. And you get some kind of a diagonal. It basically means that different genetic traits are acting in different cell types. And that we're actually starting to look at an unbiased picture of human disease. So we can actually start grouping all of these genetic traits into the cell types in which they might be acting. And if you look at inflammatory bowel disease, well, it is enriched in both immune cells as well as digestive cells. And it makes a lot of sense that there's this regulation in both types of cells that is associated with IBD. Heart falls, you know, uh, blood pressure falls in heart, cholesterol falls in liver, you know, a bunch of stuff falls in brain, and Alzheimer's disease, where would you expect Alzheimer's disease to act? Brain, right? So, well, the data seems to disagree. It seems to act in monocytes. And if we go back to our data, Alzheimer's disease, has no enrichment in brain. Instead, it has an enrichment in CD14 plus T cells and some enrichment here in immune cells. Is our data wrong or is our textbook wrong? Turns out that the story is slightly more complicated. And luckily, we you know, are surrounded by amazing scientists and Li Hui Tsai in particular at the Picower Institute work with us to actually figure out what's going on with this immune enrichment for Alzheimer's. And we actually published a paper in the same issue of Nature saying that if we look at both human and mice, we seem to be finding the same signature that immune cells are in fact a causal component of Alzheimer's disease. So we basically looked at mice in the process of development of Alzheimer's disease. So she's built a mouse model of Alzheimer's that has all of the symptoms of Alzheimer's, but much more rapidly. And that allows us to now profile the epigenomic landscape, both early and late, to basically look at what's happening. And what we found is indeed <coughs> that neuronal activity goes down, as the textbook says, but also immune and inflammatory processes go up. And that's an observation that people have made for a long time. But a simple interpretation of that was that inflammation happens when you have neurodegeneration.
So maybe inflammation is in fact a consequence of neurodegeneration. But what we're finding in the mouse data is that the neuronal repression happens at later time points than the immune activation, which happens quite early. And that's true at the RNA level, at the promoter level, and at the enhancer level. So that basically got us thinking that, hey, wait, maybe it's actually the other way around. Maybe it's the immune cell dysregulation that's leading to the neuronal loss. And indeed, we found this nearly perfect correlation between the enhancers that went up in the mouse during the degeneration and whether these regions contain genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's disease in humans. But the, this was not true at all in neuronal cell types. In fact, neuronal cell types were some of the least enriched for Alzheimer's genetic variants, whereas the immune cell types were the most enriched. So that basically says that immune cell dysregulation is in fact a causal component of Alzheimer's disease. And that can happen through multiple mechanisms. One of them is microglial cells that are actually CD14 plus negative, uh, sorry, positive, which are the resident immune cells of the adult brain. And these can actually be involved in neuronal pruning that uh, can have a very strong effect in neurodegeneration. And lastly, the macrophages that actually infiltrate the brain during neurodegeneration because of the blood-brain barrier um, falling uh, apart. So you end up with a, a very different focus of what might actually be driving my disease and a very different focus when it comes to therapeutic development. Instead of focusing on the neurons, maybe we should be focusing on the immune cells because they are the causal component of the disease and that's extremely important. The other aspect is to actually use epigenomic annotation for fine mapping these disease regions. So the first part was figure out the causal cell type. Another part was how do we actually find what is the causal disease uh, SNP? And Here's the problem. Linkage disequilibrium in the human genome basically means that large regions are co-inherited in blocks. Here I'm showing you a large number of genetic variants, all of which are, are associated with obesity, all of which are falling within the same region in this FTO uh, locus. And what you can see here is that these genetic variants across the human population are always co-inherited. That basically means that if I have this particular variant here, and that's a G, I can actually predict almost every other variant in that region because genetic regions are inherited in blocks in the human genome. These big spikes here is where recombination events happen. So during meiosis, you're much more likely to have a recombination event here than anywhere else in that region. And that basically means that this block is almost never separated when I actually go and carry out a genome-wide association study. So all the individuals that had a G here also have an A here and a T here and a G here, and I cannot simply tell apart these genetic variants from each other. So linkage disequilibrium, which was a blessing for the initial mapping because I could only use one tag in this entire region and suddenly predict the remaining ones, has now become a curse for fine mapping because I simply can't tell them apart. Is everybody with me on this point? Raise your hands if you are, it's a subtle point, great. So what that basically means is that I need to use functional annotations in order to predict the causal variant or the causal variants. Basically, I'm looking now at a 47,000 region of the, you know, 47,000 nucleotide region of the human genome. 89 common variants, all of which are co-inherited I simply don't know from the genetics alone which one is the causal one. And that's where the functional information comes in. So how can I use that inf functional information? First of all, I can actually use epigenomic information of which ones of these genetic variants are falling in enhancers. So here you can see that the first, the second, and the third all have the same p-value, the same association with the disease, but only one of them is in fact falling in enhancer regions. So I can actually utilize that information for fine mapping. Clear with everyone? There's a question. One of the questions that community workers are really interested in, like, there's a combination rate of plant and plant trees. Is that inferred from the genomics that is the fact that the kids that you're working with are co-occurring, or is there independent information from? So, so the question is, where are these genetic uh, recombination uh, hotspots inferred from? And the, the answer is, yes, you can infer it directly from the genetics by simply asking, how frequently do I see regions of, uh, you know, of breakage? Yeah, I can infer it from looking at families and how 
my association with dad or with mom switches and at what locations it switches. And I can also infer it from the specific proteins that bind the genome that actually induce recombination. And one such protein is PRDM9. And all of them agree, and they basically say that there's a small number of recombination hotspots in the human genome, and that's what determines these linkage to equilibrium blocks. Sure. Any other questions? Great. So we basically have these blocks and within, so, so that was great for, for mapping and it's terrible for fine mapping. So within these blocks now, we have multiple genetic variants and we can utilize the functional information to find out which ones are more likely to be causal. So one line of evidence is enhancer activity. Another line of evidence is asking what are the regulatory motifs that are disrupted by each one of these variants. So if some of these variants are in fact, uh, you know, not changing anything in the binding sites, and others are, then you can actually start making a prediction as to which ones are functional. And the last line of evidence you can use is actually look at evolutionary constraint. So you can compare multiple mammals, and you can look at where are the conserved regions and where are the non-conserved regions. And what you can see is that in this particular case, the second uh, SNP is in fact happening in a region that does not seem to vary between different mammals. So that means that that region is actually quite important, okay? So multiple lines of evidence allow us to now start doing functional fine mapping. And of course, all of that information is extremely complex and navigating it can be a challenge. So we put together a website called Haploreg, and this is the work by uh, Luke Ward, uh, that actually looks at every genetic variant that you're interested in, or for example, an entire GWAS uh, and all of the results, and it basically says for every region of association, what are all of the genetic variants and what are the annotations that are overlapping in each of them? So what are the conserved elements? What are the promoter regions? What are the enhancer regions? What are the uh, accessible regions? Where are the regions of DNA binding? What are the specific mutations that disrupt motifs? Which ones of those are EQTLs? Which ones of those happen in protein coding regions, in tronic regions, and so on and so forth? So you can actually go and mine any kind of GWAS um, uh, data set through all of the ENCODE and roadmap epigenomics data simply by Googling haploreg and then you'll find it uh, right there. And then the last, or actually, you know, uh, the, next step, the next step is, you know, you know the causal cell type, you know the causal variant, you still want to know how's that genetic variant acting and you'd like to find who are the target genes. And there's three types of evidence that we can utilize to actually predict the target genes. The first line of evidence is that the genome is not just a linear string inside our DNA, it's actually wrapped around in very important ways. And that wrapping can be ascertained by looking at what distal genetic, uh, genomic regions are more likely to interact. So basically take the whole spaghetti soup, I chop it up in a bunch of different ways, and then I sequence fragments that were near each other. So basically I cause them to ligate, you know, uh, connect the spaghetti chunks, and then the chunks that connect together are more likely to have been together in three dimensions. And then I sequence and I look at how often is this region of the genome interacting with that region of the genome. And you know, if it was all random, you would expect some sort of, you know, glow around the X equals Y line. But in fact, what you see is that these very distal regions appear to be lighting up suggesting that this particular region here is actually more likely to be physically interacting with that distal region here. Is this clear with everyone? Great, fabulous. So in this particular example, I'm actually showing the FTO locus itself and I'm showing some very distal interactions with this IRX5 gene that actually happens to sit 1.2 million nucleotides away. So that basically suggests that this regulatory locus, even though it sits here, in three dimensions is very proximal to this gene here and maybe even to that gene here. It's kind of cool, right? So it basically says that there's long distance effects that are simply very easy for the DNA because these things are actually sitting together in three dimensions. The other line of evidence comes from the functional genomics data. As I mentioned earlier, if I look at different tissues and what genes are active and what enhancers are active, I can see that this particular enhancer is turning on in the same tissues that this gene is turning on. So I can actually predict that if a genetic variant falls here, it's more likely to target that gene and if a genetic variant falls here, it's more likely to target that gene because of the correlation patterns. Is this clear with everyone? Great. 
And then the third line of evidence, which is the killer uh, line of evidence, it's the best one, is that if I have genetic differences between individuals, which I can associate obviously to cases and controls uh, in, in GWAS, and that's how GWAS happens, I can also associate those with changes in the expression levels of nearby genes. And if a genetic variant is associated with higher or lower expression, it basically means that this genetic variant is likely to have an intermediate molecular effect on the expression of that gene here, and therefore that it's not only close in three dimensions, it's not only correlated, moreover, the genetic variant actually has a functional effect on the expression of that gene. Everybody with me on that line, last line of evidence? So we're going to combine all three to actually start predicting the target genes through these, these associations that are happening. So that's what we've done so far. We've basically characterized the, gen, the epigenomic landscape. We've actually linked together these regions into circuits, and we're able to start identifying disease-relevant tissues and regulators, predict the upstream regulators, predict the target genes, predict the uh, cell types in which they're acting. Let's put all of that together to start understanding GWAS. Okay? So I'm going to tell you how we can go through these six steps in one of the most important regions of the human genome. Okay? So the first step, as I mentioned earlier, was to identify the relevant tissue and cell type, and that's looking at the epigenomic annotations. Number two, predict the target genes, and that's looking at physical proximity, genetic evidence, as well as correlation between the, the activity of this region and the activity of the target gene. Predict the causal nucleotide, and that's coming from the epigenomic fine mapping, as well as the evolutionary conservation, as well as the regulatory motifs that are disrupted. Predict the upstream regulator, and that actually comes from the specific motifs that are changed, allow you to now predict who, who's binding, which is the regulator whose binding is more likely to be altered. And then lastly, the last two steps, we don't have that many tools for, but number one, what are the cellular phenotypes? And that's where you can actually utilize gene expression patterns as a surrogate to start understanding what are the cellular effects. And lastly, for every different you know, phenotype, it's going to be a, a, a crazy endeavor to figure out how the cellular phenotypes and how all that circuitry ultimately translates to, to organismal phenotypes. And we just published all that in the context of this FTO locus. So this is a paper that we just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, this is in collaboration with Medina Klausenzer, who's a professor uh, here at Harvard and also a member of the Broad. So what is that FTO region? The FTO region is the strongest genetic association with obesity. I don't need to tell you how important obesity is. Uh, it actually affects more than 500 million people worldwide. And in the United States alone, it costs $200 billion a year to the economy. It's a plague in our society that affects uh, neurological disorders, cardiovascular disorders, endocrine, musculoskeletal, renal, gastrointestinal, pulmonary, and psychosocial aspects of a person's life. And that actually contributes to the morbidity and the mortality of some of the biggest killers uh, in our society, including cardiovascular disease. The strongest genetic association with obesity was discovered in 2007 in this region known as FTO, fat and obesity associated. And I, I showed you this region earlier. It had 89 common variants in uh, LD. So it's very difficult to figure out what's the causal cell type. The predicted tissue in which it acts has always been the brain. People have assumed that this acts in the brain because, number one, the FTO gene itself is expressed in the hypothalamus. And number two, the very simple equation that we've heard about obesity is how much I eat and how much I exercise. Energy in, energy out. Very simple equation, and it's all governed by the brain. It's all my decision as to what I'm going to eat and whether I'm going to exercise or not. But when we look at the epigenomic data, we got a very different picture. Instead of the brain being, you know, lighting up with our epigenomic marks, we found that mesenchymal stem cells lit up in this region of association. We found a 12,000 nucleotide super enhancer. This is a massive regulatory switch. And that region acts specifically in the progenitors of white fat cells, which are the bad fat cells that store a lot of, a lot of lipids, and beige fat cells, which are very similar to white fat cells, but they're able to actually burn energy as heat through a process known as thermogenesis or heat generation. And they're very similar to brown 
fat, which is a good fat that you've all heard about, which is very rich in these mitochondria that generate heat, but it is developmentally more closely related to white adipocytes. So we found that this massive enhancer is the precursor of these two cell types. So that was a hint that maybe it doesn't act only in the brain, maybe it acts directly in fat cells. The second line of evidence, I already showed you these long distance interactions between the genetic uh, locus and these two downstream genes, IRX3 and IRX5. And that means that these regions might be genetic targets because they're co-localized in three dimensions. But the killer line of evidence is EQTLs to basically show that genetic differences in FTO between risk and non-risk individuals are in fact leading to genetic differences in the expression of these genes. And we indeed found that line of evidence specifically in the precursor cells that give rise to these white or beige adipocytes. We found that two genes, IRX3 and IRX5, that are sitting 500,000 nucleotides away and 1.2 million nucleotides away are in fact the two targets. And the FTO gene itself has simply no significant change in expression. So that basically says that we've been focusing on the wrong tissue and on the wrong target gene. And then the last thing was how do we now figure out who is the upstream regulator? How do we find the causal nucleotide? And that's where we used motif enrichments, that was where we used evolutionary conservation, both pointing to a single nucleotide change that disrupts an AT rich motif by a T to C alteration. And we were able to sort of go and find the upstream regulator R85B based on the motif match, perturb it, and show that in fact it is epistatic that you need both the intact regulator and the intact motif in order to get successful repression. So we were able to crack, using these techniques that I mentioned, the cellular, the, the, the regulatory circuitry of this region. We went from 47,000 nucleotides to a single nucleotide. We went from any tissue to specifically the preadipocytes. We went from this particular gene being the focus to these two very distal target genes being the focus. We went to the upstream regulator that modulates the whole thing. But I still haven't told you how this actually leads to obesity. And that's where genome-wide expression analysis comes in. So we looked at all of the genes that were positively or negatively co-expressed with IRX3 and IRX5. And we found two classes of genes that were lighting up. One positively correlated with the risk, uh, and that's actually lipid metabolism. And the other one negatively correlated with risk, and that's mitochondrial activity, suggesting that, in fact, this genetic variant is leading to a shift from energy dissipation through thermogenesis to energy <coughs> storage through lipid metabolism. And we were able to now use this circuitry, because we actually have the parts, to manipulate the downstream target genes, the upstream regulator, and using CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, even the single nucleotide that we predict to be the driver. And that basically says that by understanding the non-coding genome, we can actually intervene. We can do something about the disease. And in every single case, we saw that we could actually switch between lean and obese phenotypes by manipulating the circuitry. By editing a single nucleotide out of 3.2 billion nucleotides in the, in the human genome, we were able to alter the expression of these two genes up to 1.2 million nucleotides away and restore them back by editing that same nucleotide back using a different guide RNA. We're able to actually restore the process of thermogenesis by a factor of seven with a single nucleotide alteration. We were able to actually show that the downstream target genes, IRX3 and IRX5, are sufficient to recapitulate the differences between risk and non-risk individuals. We were able to actually show that the single gene, IRX3, when knocked down in mouse using a dominant negative form that's expressed in adipose tissue, actually leads to a two-fold change in the fat mass of these mice. It leads to the inability to put on weight in a high-fat diet. And it leads to energy dissipation, which is higher when the mice are awake or when the, when the mice are sleeping. So this is actually shifting the metabolism of these mice. And we can actually use all that to understand the mechanism underlying what has been a huge puzzle in our community for more than seven years. And this is only variant number 14 in a list of several hundred that we are able to now start dissecting systematically to translate genetic findings into therapeutics. So I'm going to stop there and tell you that we can also utilize both a combination of genetic information and epigenetic information together to discover new genes that are involved in disease. 
and we actually can systematically in a high throughput fashion start experimentally dissecting thousands of these disease regions. So this has been an incredible collaboration with amazing individuals. The Roadmap Epigenomics Project, these are the co-first uh, authors. For the FTO story, this is the uh, first author and co-corresponding author, Melina. Um, and then uh, I, I didn't have time to go into the details of these other collaborations. So I'll stop there and maybe leave you with one more point, which is this is a systematic approach which is very, very general. We are understanding the circuitry of every cell type that we can get our hands on, and that can actually have a very strong impact on a large number of different traits. I talked to you about Alzheimer's and obesity. In collaboration with Chris, actually, we've looked at cardiac function, we've looked at Alzheimer's disease, prostate cancer, and you know, red blood cell traits, neuronal function, cancer phenotypes, and all of that is because we are actually taking a foundational approach. Let's understand the circuitry first, and now we can establish collaboration with very different disease areas in order to apply that circuitry to the genome systematically. And I think I'll stop there. If, uh, um, great, thank you.